this evening I, with my co-chair, Mr. Oren Saha. Um, we're going to talk about upper GI and HPB trauma. We've got uh, a stellar uh, set of presenters. Uh, I think you'll find what they have to say uh, extremely interesting and insightful. Uh, in all the webinars we've held to date, we've really encouraged uh, uh, audience participation. Uh, ask your questions. Uh, and at the moment, we would like you to do this via the um, chat um, button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you use the Q&A, we will find the questions, but it'd be easier for us if you use the chat function. Um, so what I'm going to do, so what I'm going to do is now hand over to my co-chair, Mr. Oren Saha, who's going to introduce our first speaker, Oren. Thanks, Andy. It's a real pleasure to open this uh, meeting session with um, Mr. Nick Maynard speaking about the management of esophageal injury. Mr. Maynard has been consultant upper GI surgeon at Oxford for over 20 years and been heavily involved in developing numerous guidelines and setting quality standards in upper GI surgery. He's the lead clinician for Cancer Oxford and the present elect of August and a leading authority on management of complex esophageal pathology. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Oren, um, and thank you for asking me to give a talk today. So I, I'm going to talk about esophageal injury. I know the sort of webinar is all about trauma, but there's not a lot of trauma to the esophagus. So it's really all forms of injury I'm going to talk about. Um, clearly, injuries to the esophagus can be partial or full thickness, and they have very clearly different implications for what's going to happen to the patient. Um, they're... Full thickness perforations of the esophagus coming in as an emergency are not particularly common. Shiraz Markar did a wrote a paper in the American Journal of Gastroenterology a few years ago, and he used HES data to analyze the incidence of this problem in the UK. And there were at that time about 200 cases being admitted to UK hospitals per annum with a perforated esophagus. And the average mortality was about 35%. You'll see from that first graph in the top right-hand corner um, that the incident, the mortality is getting better over the years. And you won't be that surprised to know from the bottom graph that the mortality is less in centers where they deal with a lot of this sort of problem. And one of the themes of what I'm gonna talk about is the importance of at least discussing the case with a specialist centre and, and probably referring most of those cases to the resectional centre. Um, there are four categories of esophageal injury. Um, iatrogenic trauma, and by far the commonest is that as a result of endoscopy. And I've put the figures down there for the incidence of perforation of the esophagus according to what you're doing at endoscopy from diagnostic to stent insertion and also transesophageal echocardiography. The other category of iatrogenic trauma is surgery, um, most commonly hiatal surgery, where there's anti-reflux surgery, repair of a hiatus hernia or achalasia surgery, but occasionally damage to the esophagus can, can happen in lung surgery or cardiac surgery. Uh, there's non-iatrogenic trauma, the most common being a food bolus or usually a fishbone perforation of the esophagus. And we see very little penetrating or blunt trauma of the esophagus in our country, although that is commoner elsewhere in the world. Um, you'll all be familiar with spontaneous rupture of the esophagus due to uh, the, the so-called Boerhaave syndrome. And of course, we, st we do see a regular flow of caustic injuries, usually as a result of suicidal intent and usually due to alkali, occasionally due to acid. Um, the clinical features are, are fairly common, uh, fairly est well established. Surgical emphysema is not always present, but it often is present. And once, once you've seen that, it's very, very obvious. Most people get quite a lot of pain with them. Uh, respiratory compromise is extremely common to varying degrees. And obviously, if the injury is quite old, they'll be increasing evidence of end organ um, features of sepsis. Uh, Mackler described his triad of, 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 of clinical features about 50 years ago of pain, chest pain, uh, in the presence of vomiting and with, with surgical emphysema. Now, a majority of these injuries are 
uh, and, and I'm talking about spontaneous perforation of the esophagus, are incorrectly diagnosed at presentation. And all esophageal surgeons will be very familiar with the call from the respiratory ward, you know, usually on a Friday evening when the patient's been there for three or four days with a pleural effusion and they've suddenly clicked that it's GI tract contents coming out. So it's very common that they're not diagnosed early on. Um, and, it, and it's really important that when you see these patients, you consider the very precise circumstance of the onset of symptoms and have a very high index of suspicion. Was there vomiting at the time of the chest pain? Have they had an endoscopy recently, etc.? And if you don't have that uh, high index of suspicion, it, you, you may miss the diagnosis. Most of them will have had a chest X-ray and that may show a hydrothorax or a pneumothorax, may show mediastinal air as well. But the most important imaging is a CT scan with oral and IV contrast. Dynamic contrast studies are sort of a, 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 a water soluble contrast swallow or barium swallow is, is less common now, but they do have their role and, and clearly can demonstrate a leak. And, and don't forget endoscopy, uh, which is a very important tool, certainly if you're unsure about the diagnosis, and it must be done by an experienced endoscopist with minimal insufflation, but it's a really important tool to use. And on the left, you'll see a, a traditional uh, water soluble contrast swallow showing most of the contrast leaving the esophagus and going down the chest drain. And on the right, you'll see a CT scan. Um, you can see my, with my arrow, you can see subcutaneous em surgical emphysema in the, in, the, in the chest wall there. You've got lots of new, new of posterior mediastinal air there and a complex pleural effusion due to the due to the perforated esophagus. This is an end endoscopic picture of a caustic injury of a patient who'd, who'd ingested some alkali and you can see the, the extensive damage in the upper part of the, in the mid esophagus. And with conservative treatment, you can see on the right hand side, it's fully healed several weeks later. So endoscopy is a really important investigation in assessing these injuries. I'm not going to read this out to you, but you'll be familiar with this, this the original description of the Boerhaave syndrome. Um, it, it's a longitudinal tear usually, can be very short, can be very long. The majority are in the left posterior lateral wall, majority in males, and the commonest in the fourth to sixth decades. Um, I think this, you, you, you may be familiar with the, the, the description of it, and I won't read it out other than to say that, 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 that Professor Boerhaave was struck by the strong odour of roast duck and olive oil when he did the post-mortem. So how do you treat these injuries? Well, they are a fairly diverse group of injuries and, and it's important to have some very clear principles to how you treat it. We've talked about the importance of early diagnosis and that's vital. Um, certainly discuss with and consider transfer to the specialist esophago gastric recensional centre. There may be some grounds for considering remote management if you're going to treat them conservatively and get serial imaging and discuss regularly and I think that does have a place. It's very important very early on to stratify patients into non-operative approach or to an operative management. Aggressive and early surgical and or radiological decontamination with drains. Um, an aggressive management of sepsis, usually and often in a critical care setting, and of course, early nutrition. There are some patients you can treat conservatively, certainly those with a partial thickness tear, the sort of typical Mallory Weiss tear, which will cause bleeding, maybe pain, but won't cause the infective complications, and they can certainly be treated conservatively. Some full thickness uh, perforations can be treated conservatively, particularly those without contamination. Of course, the commonest form of that are the endoscopic perforations. They've been nil by mouth, they have an empty stomach, and they can almost invariably be treated conservatively without the need for surgery, because there will be usually minimal contamination. Uh, nutritional support is paramount, ideally enteral nutrition, but parenteral if you haven't got enteral access. Rest the esophagus, have them nil by mouth, proton pump inhibitors, appropriate use of antimicrobials and empty the stomach with it with some form of drainage. Endoscopic therapy can help a lot with these 
conditions. Um, I've talked already about endoscopic assessment. If, you, if you're not sure about the diagnosis, do an endoscopy, and that can be really helpful. And it, I find it very helpful as, as an adjunct to planning your endoscopic or operative management. And certainly if I operate on these, I invariably do an endoscopy myself on the table to help plan the approach. You can treat these things endoscopically. I mean, if, it, if it's a small endoscopic perforation, you can clip it endoscopically. There is a role for putting stents, stents and I'm a bit of a stent skeptic, I'm afraid, for perforations. We'll come back to that in a minute. But I'm an increasing fan of endoscopic vacuum therapy, and I'm going to talk a bit about that later. You can also place a nasogastric or nasogestional tube for drainage, for feeding, and particularly with caustic strictures to maintain luminal patency when it does inevitably stricture down. Now, what about stents? I, I am a bit of a skeptic, I'm afraid, but I know there'll be a lot of people listening, and perhaps on the panel who use them, so I won't dismiss them completely. Um, that they, there is a, a significant risk of complications. And one of the problems with all the literature on stents is, that is it's a very heterogeneous group of people. It's anastomotic leaks, it's spontaneous perforations with contamination, it's endoscopic perforations. So it's very difficult to get a consistent message. But they do migrate, they do cause bleeding, they do erode. Um, there's a, a mortality risk of about 3%, usually due to erosion into a major vessel and airway and an overall mortality rate associated with stent insertion of 15%. There's no doubt they can be successfully deployed and they do, they can work, but often repeated stent, uh, further stents are necessary and the average number of stake or the median number of stents is about three. There's no evidence they reduce mortality. The main benefit does seem to be reducing the time to oral intake, but there's no really good evidence that they reduce the time to heal. And in most of the literature, the average time of to he healing with a stent is 30 days. They are clearly very useful in a perforated malignant stricture if you're not going to resect it. And they can have a role, particularly with a temporary stent, a removable stent in a perforated benign stricture. And as always, the dilemma is just because you can put it in, it doesn't mean you should put it in. So I'm a declared skeptic about stents in, 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 per in perforations, but I know people do use them. So um, uh, you know, it, 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 there may be a role. You'll be very familiar with this. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, 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 a few pieces of literature detailing anecdotal experiences, and we've certainly published. We've had about a dozen we've put in now for perforator esophagus with very good results, but it's early days. You'll be familiar with the technique. You endoscope, and this is the, on the left is is the the, the cavity sponge insertion. The scope you get your scope through the hole into the cavity and then you put an over tube through it and then push this sponge into it um, and apply negative vacuum pressure onto that and and this needs to be changed every three to five days uh, and and you can get some dramatic results we prefer to put it in the lumen you can see down the bottom same principle we tend to leave it in the lumen rather than the cavity and that can be equally effective we are real enthusiasts about this in Oxford. I mean, my colleague Bruno Scromo has got the most experience and, and has treated quite a lot of them now. And we have seen some really great results. So our preferred method of endoscopic treatment is this rather than using a stent. Um, but some of them do need surgery. Um, and there are various considerations before you decide how you're going to operate and what you're going to do. Clearly, where is the perforation? Is the neck, chest or abdomen? how long it's been from the injury to the definitive treatment, because that will determine how much contamination there is, what, how healthy the, the tissues are, and obviously the physiological state of the patient. But the principles are, it's certainly, we always endoscope them ourselves to assess the, where it is and the, and the size of the hole, decide what approach, left chest, right chest, neck, abdomen, extensive lavage is terribly important, and you then got to make a decision whether you can repair it. Usually if it's less than 12 hours old, you can repair it. If it's more than 24 hours, it's very rare you can repair it. Between 12 and 24 hours is, is, is very variable. You may want to repair it over a large T-tube. 
um, you may want to just do an extensive debridement and, and then and repair it over a T-tube. And occasionally you may need to resect the esophagus. And of course, you've got to make sure the lung re-expands properly. And that might need an extensive decortication if it's an old injury. Um, I'm going to finish up with a couple more slides. The, this summarizes the different surgical options. Right thoracotomy or laparotomy, left thoracotomy, that is appropriate. Extensive lavage, primary repair, reinforce. You can buttress your repair with a mentum if it's low down, with pleura, with the intercostal muscle or pericardium. Um, if you are going to use a T-tube, use a big T-tube and occasionally you might resect, as I've talked about. Do consider enteral access for feeding and a venting gastrostomy. I'm going to take questions here. I'm going to leave that up for you to look at while we're doing questions. It's an adapted algorithm that we it was published many years ago, but we've adapted it with with an update. Um, and it's, it's an approach that we find works for, for, for this condition. So I'll leave it like that, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that fantastic talk and for such clear guidance, Nick, on this really challenging condition. I know it kind of terrifies many of us in the upper GI world. We've got several questions already, as you might expect, and they're kind of primarily grouped around um, endosponge. Um, how do you decide when it will be beneficial? Is there a cavity that's too big or too small? Um, do you have any kind of size criteria for how you might use it? Well, as I said, we, so we, we started off uh, using it intra cavity shall we say and i think and and again as i say bruno my colleague's got the most experience in our unit of this and clearly if you've got an established leak with a cavity then 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 it can be very useful it's not i think if you've got a an, a, a spontaneous perforation or an iatrogenic perforation and you're dealing with it early on you won't have that cavity so we would favor using it as an intraluminal uh, vacuum sponge uh, uh, and we've had some really good, some really good results using it like that. Sure. And have you, so we've got some other questions kind of um, asking around other options for drainage, particularly um, the operated route. And um, there are some comments about the role of T-tubes um, uh, with um, uh, people talking about its relative use or relative potential risks and dangers. Do you think a T-tube really does help? Um, or as um, Abiza says, I think uh, an almost mythical status at times. <laughs> well, I think the trouble is, I, I think they can help, but I, 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 I absolutely get that they don't always help. I think the problem is that most hospitals don't stock big T-tubes. Um, and if you ask for a T-tube and they give you a sort of a standard six millimetre, four millimetre T-tube, it's a complete waste of time. Uh, so the only success I've ever had is is you can easily get eight millimeter ones. I've seen we've got we've used a set of a one centimeters one as well. So I think if you're going to use it, it's got to be more than eight millimeters. And most hospitals don't stock them. We do now for these circumstances. And I think they don't work in the same way that, uh, in my view, that um, that um, that the biliary T tubes in because you don't get much coming out of the T tube. You can do sometimes. But they 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 do facilitate controlled drainage around it. So yes, I think I I have they have worked, but they've got to be a very big T tube. And and the trouble is most people's experience is using small T tubes when they're useless. Thanks, Nick. And finally, there's a couple of comments and questions um, about some uh, slightly rarer ways of managing or more novel ways of managing. Um, Stuart Andrews has asked about um, their unit using a transgastric placed esophageal drain. And there's also a couple of questions around the role of tissue glue. Any experience with those methods or um, techniques? Yeah, we've certainly used transgastric and we've so, so uh, 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 I, I presume Stuart's talking about transgastric, putting a tube up through the sockers and then, and then draining it that way. So we've certainly done that. And you can do that at antegrade as well without having without having a, a ESO sponge there, just having a drain going through the hole, sort of nasogastric, a naso a transnasal tube going down and draining the cavity that way. And we've certainly done that on several occasions. I haven't any experience of tissue glue. Again, well, so we, we've, got a, we've, got, we've got experience with um, trying to glue fistulae as a result of a perforation, either into, into, uh, in, into, a, into a esophagocutaneous fistula or into the lung. And we've sealed a couple of those with a combination of, of coils and glue.
But in terms of tissue glue to, to, to seal the hole, I've got no experience with that. And of course, I guess very, very early on, uh, they may have some role, but I would probably just primarily repair that. But when you've got any sepsis around, I doubt glue would help very much, but I haven't got any experience. And finally, just before we, we move on, a couple more questions about the technical aspects of the endosponge. Do you have any, do you change the negative pressure when you're using them intraluminally? Um, uh, the Gloucester unit have, have said that they, they found it to be uncomfortable sometimes for patients. No, we haven't. We've, done, we've used exactly the same pressures as intracavity. That's great. Well, Nick, thank you so much for that. Um, really valuable talk and a really great algorithm at the end for all of us to go by. I'm going to hand you back to Andy now, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Oren. Thanks, Nick. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Giles Tugood, who really to this audience lead, needs little in the way of introduction. He's our president of Algis. Uh, he's been a HPB and trauma surgeon at Leeds uh, for a long time now and brings a wealth of experience. And more recently, um, uh, he's heading up our new emergency surgery unit at Leeds. <coughs> and Giles is going to talk to us today on the management of liver trauma. Giles. Thanks, Andy, and thanks for all your efforts putting these together. And good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sure you've got nothing better to do on a Wednesday evening. Um, so, um, is that not, why is that not? Oh, there we go. Yeah, brilliant. So that's just to make you feel jealous that uh, a few of us who do work in Yorkshire um, and probably to make you want to come to Yorkshire. That's the view from um, Andy Smith's back garden, which is rather nice. Um, so liver trauma. Um, this is a relatively old paper and it's the only paper I'm going to quote in the whole of this uh, quick talk. Um, and I think it just shows really that few of us deal with surgically deal with liver trauma uh, around the country, around this country, certainly. It's not a particularly common thing that we come across. And when it does happen, it can be pretty scary. Um, so six years ago, and I think this is an understatement, you know, 70% of liver injury was treated uh, conservative with non-operative management. Uh, and it usually has a fairly good success rate. I suspect the amount of embolization quoted in this paper is a lot more than 3% now. But clearly, again, when it's done, it works well. The striking figures at the bottom there is that the, the, the mortality following surgery is pretty high, whereas the mortality following non-operative management um, is good. So, you know, there are a lot of experienced people listening here and, um, and obviously some trainees too, but the, the, I think the pattern of injury is always very important. Um, the suspicion clinically that there might be something going on, clinically the status of the patient and abdominal signs, and I think ultimately it comes down to maybe a, a full blood count, but also a CT scan. It seems to be the world gets a CT scan these days. And I'm not going to go into deep detail about classification. Um, it's either peripheral, it's moderate, or it's pretty deep. Um, initial management, um, resuscitation, obviously. And I think if the patient does become stable or is stable, then non-operative management is clearly the way forward. If there's a suspicion that there is some bleeding, but um, you've managed to stabilize the patient, then I think we're heading towards the radiology department. But otherwise, in an unstable patient, or if you suspect other significant injury abdominally, then there is obviously going to be an indication to take them to the operating room. So, just a quick word on operative management and then I'll come back to it. The um, patient will continue to need careful observation. Um, you probably are going to do some uh, serial CTs, but I think the important thing here is to treat the patient clinically. Just because they've got a collection doesn't mean to say they need a drain, whether it's blood, old blood or bile, whatever. Treat the patient, not the scan. Um, they're going to probably need angiography or embolization. They will probably, they may get, they may get biliary problems and they, if they get biliary problems, they'll probably get septic problems, all of which needs to be sorted out. 
So if you have this unstable patient, um, and I suspect there's some very uh, experienced liver surgeons on this webinar, and I suspect between us, um, we wouldn't have done this more than once or twice a year each, um, would be a guess. Um, but if you are in this situation, um, you need some senior people around. Um, I always remember the difference um, between you having a senior anaesthetist who, who's well on top of the blood products and perhaps a more junior, uh, junior anaesthetist who hasn't quite got ahead of things. So make sure you've got someone senior at the top end of the patient and they are giving fluids appropriately with decent uh, blood products, including FFP, platelets, and all that sort of stuff. Have your attractors ready. It takes a while. If you use an Omnitract, for example, it takes a while to get one of those in place. Get it ready, because as soon as you open up the abdomen, you're losing any tamponade that you have. So have your attractors ready. Have your suckers ready. Have your packs ready. And if you think there's perhaps some thoracic injury, um, have a, have a thoracic surgeon getting in the car and coming in from home and possibly think about having another senior pair of hands, a colleague, a close colleague uh, to, to help as well. So here are a couple of CT scans. Um, not many of us have um, pictures and videos of, of liver trauma. You kind of got other things on your mind while you're doing the stuff. Um, but you know, you can get some pretty serious injuries as you can see from those two scans of the right lobe and not need to go in at all. But if you do, um, the first thing is clearly to, to use packs. Um, don't shove the packs down the cracks, shove the packs around the liver and divide, divide the falciform ligament. Uh, if you've got some reasonable control, divide the peritoneal flexions my rule about mobilizing the liver is you've always, you've got to join all the dots, divide all the peritoneal reflections before you start mobilizing the liver. You'll tear liver capsule in a, in a normal liver, let alone in a traumatized liver. So divide peritoneal reflections if you're going to start mobilizing the liver. Now, this is why liver surgery in girls, in female patients, is so much easier than in big blokes. It's because you can get your hands around the liver. And um, this is a fantastic maneuver. I use it all the time uh, with liver surgery and it's in, 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 in invaluable with liver trauma and lifting the liver up as well after you've lifting liver out of the abdomen because you lift it patient, the liver out of the abdomen, you will reduce the uh, CBP and therefore reduce bleeding. So that's a great maneuver to get once you've, You've sucked out, you've got down to the liver, because it's often a bath when you get in there, red bath, then get your hands around that liver. So if you still got bleeding, you need to just check everywhere else, you know, check behind the liver, make sure there isn't some major cable. I mean, usually the big cable injuries, they, they haven't even got into hospital, obviously, but there may be a, a cable injury. Um, there may be more bleeding behind the right and the left lobes and even behind the, um, Porter, but check anyway if it's dry, but certainly obviously if it's if it's still bleeding. Um, the Pringle maneuver, whether you use a clamp like that or whether you use um, whether you use a tape and a snugger, uh, is is a personal choice. Uh, I'm a bit of a snugger man myself, but I haven't got a, a, a picture on it. Um, but that can be invaluable. Putting a Pringle on and making sure um, you've got reduce stop the inflow into the liver and, and see where you are, get the packs on. Um, very useful. If they're still bleeding with the Pringle, it's possible, particularly if you've got arterial bleeding, that on say in the left lobe, that there's a there's an accessory left. A quarter of our a quarter of us have got an accessory left coming off the gastric, left gastric. So just check about arterial anomalies. Uh, if there's a right anomaly, um, it probably doesn't matter because you've probably got the, um, the right artery that's coming off the SMA in your Pringle. <clears throat> check for other injuries, obviously, bowel, spleen, pancreas, diet, duodenum, etc. And if there is chest issue, it, you can get good access um, through the diaphragm, but certainly, uh, doing a steno midline stenotomy is makes access so much easier and makes it access so much easier to the to the hepatic veins if there happens to be an injury there. 
So you've managed to get a bit of control, but still you might want to phone a friend. And certainly if you're in a, a, a non-transplant or non-HPB centre, you may want to get that patient stable and get them transferred. And they may then, the patient then arrives at this tertiary referral place and they might need a second look a day or two later. They might need a second look uh, in, your, in your own hospital. And they may, and, and if you do do that, make sure again, you've got a very senior team around you, preferably your usual team. Uh, it's much easier to work with people who you're familiar with. Um, they may just need the packs removing, they may need further packing. And I've, a couple of times, crikey, in, you know, 20 odd years of doing this game, um, I've got myself ready with vena venous bypass to do vascular isolation to sort out a, a major a major injury with a second look. But it's an incredibly rare need. Um, and I can only honestly say I've ever had to do that once in my life. Um, Pringle maneuver and vascular isolation um, are certainly uh, end, end, you know, real extremist type situations and really probably ever only ever going to be used um, on that second look. So I just wanted to show you one case here that highlights, uh, I think, really how much non-operative management is, is used now. Uh, and this is a patient who went through the mill, really, but actually didn't ever have an operation. He was a 24-year-old lad who'd been kicked by a horse. He worked in a, in a stable yard. And he was treated by uh, one of my colleagues for about 10 days on the ward. And he had that CT after uh, when he first came in. You can see the free fluid and see the injury to his right lobe. And I got a phone call. I suspect it was a Friday about five o'clock. No, I'm, 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 I'm sure it wasn't. But um, this was the picture we had. And um, there was increasing amount of fluid around the liver. Uh, into the abdomen, down into the pelvis. And I was asked, would I take this patient and do a laparotomy? But I noticed the hemoglobin was stable. Um, and I thought, let's just drain this and see what happens. And we drained four liters of bile. And the patient turned out a few hours later to be absolutely fine. But the drain, the bile carried on draining about three, 300 mils a day. So, um, my rule of all bile leaks eventually stop uh, was broken and we did have to do an ERCP and you can see the blush at the top right hand corner of the screen there where the leak was um, and there's all this debate about whether you know short and long stents um, of, the bile, of the bile duct whether that is better or worse and I have to say I don't think anyone really knows but if one fails try the next try the try the option the other option the next time the short stent just goes across the ampulla and the long stent goes much further up into the bile duct. Um, he, get, he did get a bit of pancreatitis of course um, but the bile drained up. He stayed on the ward because of his pancreatitis. And then five days later, he was on the, uh, you know, on the normal ward and he just crashed. Um, and that was his picture at that stage. He had, he had bled um, from a pseudoaneurysm and he was rushed down to the radiology suite and they put coils in and sorted him out. No problem at all because they're absolutely brilliant, our vascular colleagues, aren't they? And he went home a couple of days late, few, two or three days later. But then he was readmitted 10 days after that with pain and fever. And a further scan showed that he'd got a subhepatic drain, uh, sorry, a subhepatic collection, which required drainage. Uh, and again, that was bile. Um, we did a HIDA scan. I mean, that, a bit academic, I think. I'm not sure of its real clinical value, but it did show that the bile was going down the right way into the duodenum, but also there was, a, there was clearly the leak as well. But I mean, you all have to do is ask him what color his stools are to know that fact. Um, he then had a repeat ERCP, and this is where this business of short and long stents um, com comes in because it, the stent was changed. You can see the coils from put in uh, previously, uh, and he had a stent change and he, it all dried up and he eventually went home. 
And after all of that, he, he, he made a full, full recovery, um, which was great. And he hadn't had a single, uh, you know, no, no, hadn't gone to theatre once. So I think with, with any, with any form of treatment of liver trauma, whether it's surgical or more commonly now non-surgical, you've still got all these delay complication potentials, such as bile leaks, such as hematomas, such as the pseudoaneurysm that we saw in that case, such as hemobilia and sepsis. Now, this was another case, um, another young man who actually had two massive, uh, uh, he had a massive liver trauma, big laparotomy, uh, huge edema, massive hypoanemia. We couldn't close his abdominal wall. Uh, second look, same again, couldn't close his abdominal wall. He wasn't a particularly big guy, but he was so edematous and he was certainly uh, touch and go whether he was going to survive, but he did. Um, but he eventually had chronic sepsis in a collection at the back of his liver, which if we'd had to go in there with um, with open surgery would have been a real issue. His, his wound, we'd have had to go through this wound, which had become a secondary intention closure, uh, and it would have been a real business. So, um, in fact, Andy helped me with this case, and we used a sort of technique very much used with uh, pancreatitis, and minimum basically debrided the all the gubbins um, that was completely not drainable radiologically uh, with, the, with the sort of typical procedure that you pancreatic surgeons use. And he again avoided major abdominal surgery and went home a few days after that. So I think in summary, um, surgery is, is, is rarely needed now. Uh, it's incredible, I still find it incredible what a liver can look like on a CT scan and yet the patient remains clinically stable. I think if surgery is required, be ready. That's, that's the thing. Think of outside the box because as soon as you open that abdomen, you are opening up, um, you are opening yourself up to, to much more bleeding. So be ready right from the start and expect complications. Uh, most of these people don't get complications. It's incredible that they don't, but, but expect complications. Bile leaks can be very subtle, but keep an eye out for them. And most can be dealt with, as I've shown, um, radiologically without the intervention of going to theater. Thanks very much. And that is a picture of, uh, I can't remember, that might be Andy's back garden actually, as opposed to the river, but that's another one to make you want to come to Yorkshire. Thank you. Giles, thank you very much. Um, a real tour de force and a real practical um, guide uh, for anybody to manage the uh, uh, a liver trauma. Um, just a reminder to everybody uh, to place some questions on the uh, Q&A in the chat function. Uh, so Samira asks you, Samira Sharma asks, in that case that you described the first case, if there was free blood as opposed to bile and the patient was stable, what would you have done? Well, I think, I think it's a good question. Um, I think it, it goes back to what I was saying. Uh, I mean, there was quite a lot of fluid in there, wasn't there? Four litres. So maybe you've been very tempted to put a drain in that if the, if the blood had uh, lysed. Uh, um, but again, I, my, I think the principle is you treat the patient. And if the patient was well, and if the um, and if his hemoglobin was stable, and he wasn't obviously bleeding, then there's a big temptation to leave him alone. Um, so... That, that would be my, my answer. But, uh, you know, I do, I do, I do realise that four litres of blood in your abdomen is quite a lot of blood. Yeah, so the pseudoaneurysm question is very popular, Giles. So Fenella Welsh, David O'Reilly and Andy Strickland are effectively asking the same question. Uh, yeah. Should you be scanning to a liver trauma patient to look for a pseudoaneurysm on discharge or after discharge? Um, um, is there, is there a correct answer there? Is there any evidence to guide us? Well, it, it, that is a good question. I mean, I, you know, we've all been taught ever since we were at medical school that you should keep liver trauma patients in for that secondary bleed and all that sort of stuff. I mean, how have we honestly, honestly seen? And that, I, I, this is probably the only pseudoaneurysm rupture I've seen, certainly in my time. 
So I suppose my answer is uh, no, I wouldn't. Um, again, it's common sense, treat the patient. Um, if they've been stable for a few days, they can probably go home. Um, but yeah, I take the point. Um, and it was a bit of a surprise when he crashed, <laughs> but it's the only time it's ever happened to me. Uh, Cyan asks, is it better to send your patient uh, to an HPB center early as liver trauma sounds unpredictable? I, I don't, I, I think so many of these or patients, take uh, so I think so many of these patients do so well with conservative management um, without intervention these days that um, I, I don't think they all need to be transferred at all. I think they can be discussed on the phone. It's always good to have a heads up with someone um, early on. And then I think um, you, you watch the patient and I think if they get into trouble, there's, you know, there'll be local people who can put drains in, of course. And if you get into problems with difficult biliary problems, um, then transfer for sure. And, you know, um, but I, no, I, I don't think they all need to be transferred now. Okay. Cyan also asks, when, when you describe um, squeezing the liver with your hands and um, mobilizing it up, he's uh, concerned that lifting up the liver will uh, worsen any hepatic vein uh, cable injury. Do you like to comment on that? Well, that, that is, of course, right. Um, as I say, I think most serious cable injuries aren't going to get into the hospital. Um, they'll die on the scene. But if they, if there is, a, yes, I mean, that you have to do it very carefully and slowly and diligently. And But in principle, if there isn't bleeding at the back there and it's coming from the parenchyma, you are going to reduce the bleeding significantly by putting your hands around the liver and lifting it out of the wound. Okay, and one final question. Um, Newman Hamza um, asks, um, would you routinely arrange CT after any liver trauma, not, not necessarily looking for a pseudoaneurysm, but just in general, or, or would you just treat expectantly? I, th I, think, I think they've all have had a CT on arrival. Um, and then you can see how the patient goes over the next few days. I think it's, it's, it's certainly very reasonable to repeat that CT if anything clinically changes uh, or, 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 hemo, or, you know, if some of the tests change, you know, the hemoglobin drops or something. Of course it is. But I think for routine minor and moderate injuries to the liver, I'm not sure they need further imaging. Um, if they remain clinically well. Thanks, Charles. Um, uh, and thanks, a great talk and great questions. And um, I encourage everybody to keep asking the questions to our, 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 our speakers coming forth. Um, there, is one th there is one question that has arisen, Giles. I think you've misled some people about the status of my back garden. Uh, anybody's welcome to come to my back garden, but they might be a tiny bit disappointed. <laughs> Um, so please keep the questions coming in. I'm going to hand over to Oren. Thanks, Andy. Um, we're moving on to um, uh, the pancreas, and it's a real pleasure to introduce Ewan Dixon, who's a um, consultant pancreatic surgeon in the Regional Referral Unit for Complex Pancreatic and Biliary Surgery at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He combines this with a real passion for emergency care, which developed after his trauma and critical care fellowship at the Johannesburg General Hospital. It's a real pleasure to introduce him and learn from him about pancreatic trauma. Ewan, welcome. That's great, thank you very much. Can you see my screen okay, Aaron? Yeah. So good evening everyone, thanks again for the invitation. I was never sure when Andy Smith called me to give me this talk title, whether it was an observation of my elective pancreatic practice or if he was just being a little bit cute about it, but I'm going to assume that he was being kind and it's, a, it's not iatrogenic pancreatic injury he wishes me to discuss this evening. I think the first comment to make is that there really is no shortage of substrate for pancreatic disease of any nature in Scotland, particularly not in the west of Scotland. So we managed to combine heavy alcohol intake with the Glasgow knife block. And because of that combination, we see a reasonable amount of pancreatic trauma for a fairly civilised, third world country. 
So there are probably five aims for this talk. The first is to describe the challenges of early and late management of pandemic trauma. The second is to discuss the complex decision making, which I still think is the hardest part of, of any trauma uh, team management. Thirdly, look at some surgical sequences with strategies and techniques to try and help you if you are faced with a patient who has a pancreatic injury. To offer my usual anecdote, opinion, bias and surgical dogma. And probably most importantly is to try to demystify pancreatic injury. And if there was a take home message at this stage in the talk, I think the key things are to not overthink pancreatic injury and don't overtreat or overmanage pancreatic injury. So next take home message is that if you're faced with a patient who has an injured pancreas or a suspected pancreatic injury, you want to keep this really, really simple. And I think this is true of all trauma, whether it's a chest stabbing or a pancreatic injury or anything else like that. Probably the last person you want in this situation is an organ specific expert who's going to come in and apply an elective mindset to a trauma situation and just complicate matters. So keep it really, really simple. If you look at the background to pancreatic trauma, I think one of the reasons we all get a bit twitched about this is that pancreatic trauma is actually relatively uncommon, or at least it's relatively uncommon for it to present to you because about three quarters are penetrating, about 90% or more have an associated intra-abdominal injury. But the key reason they won't make it as far as your hospital or your operating room is that there's a huge uh, percentage have an associated vascular injury. And that's what accounts for most of the immediate deaths, particularly around about the head and neck of pancreas. So when they do arrive in your hospital, they can really pose some quite significant diagnostic and management dilemmas because we're just not used to seeing much trauma in general in most hospitals in the UK, and certainly not pancreatic trauma. So here are the challenges. The first thing is diagnosing the injured pancreas. The key thing here is to maintain a very high index of suspicion. Remember that you might get a call about a patient early in the disease process, that's a patient who has just been injured, or they may present to you later in the disease course with a pancreatic fistula or a pancreatic collection. So there's a spectrum along which patients may present. One of the hardest things I think is how you manage the competing injuries effectively. And because we're all now pretty much organ specific surgeons, if you go in to find a pancreatic injury with associated gastric or liver or vascular injuries, we're not all quite up to speed usually as elective surgeons at being able to manage the competing priorities that you're faced with. So because of that, I think the key to most trauma surgery is to keep your surgical options as simple as, as you possibly can. And to remember that this is physiological operating, it's not anatomical operating, it's about getting the patient out of theatre and normally the resuscitation. It's also not just a surgical disease. And in fact, usually it's not even a surgical disease. You need to have a global care strategy and that includes your radiology colleagues, your endoscopists, um, other surgical specialties, and of course, nutrition and critical care are of paramount importance as well. There are only three things you have to do if you do find yourself in the middle of a laparotomy for pancreatic trauma. So this is the operative surgical sequence. And it's the same for every injured patient. You control bleeding as the first priority. You control contamination from other injuries. And then you worry about the pancreatic juice at the end of all that. Pancreatic juice in the pancreas or outside the patient in a bag or a drain never causes a problem. It's the free pancreatic juice that was up into the chest or into the retroperitoneum that causes the issue. And controlling bleeding can be a real problem. And you have to remember that time is just not on your side. You can have patients with multifocal exsanguination who've got other competing priorities. And so you're trying to synthesize a whole range of data points very quickly. You're trying to prioritize under pressure. You're having to employ pattern recognition for patterns of injury you may never have seen before. And you have to make very quick decisions to try and achieve a good outcome. We we'll talk about the wounded surgical soul. This is a bit injure during every whipple, but the wounded surgical soul lies just here. And it's one of the most lethal intra-abdominal injuries. And that's for three reasons. You've got several large vessels, which we're not used to exposing unless you routinely do pancreatic surgery. They're all overlying each other. So you've got a whole range of arteries and veins and a very small area. 
And because most of these vessels are retroperitoneal, or at least at the back of the abdomen, they're often quite difficult to get access to get control. So the challenge here is trying to get access quickly, but also to try and keep your nerve and have an algorithm and a surgical management strategy that allows you to deal with these patients without um, getting too concerned about whether you're doing the right thing or not. So here's an elective Whipple from um, a year or so ago. This patient had had neoadjuvant therapy, so everything was a little bit stuck. But you can see here, we've, we've done the Whipple. There's the cut end of the pancreas with the pancreatic duct. And the key take home issues from this slide is to look at the number of vessels in a really small area. So you've got the portal vein, the SMV, that must have been the registrar who tore that bit there. You've got the SMA lying very close by. You've got a replaced right hepatic, the cava, the left renal vein, a sloop around the origin of the SMA as it comes off the aorta, which is just here. So lots of vessels which are hard to get to with high flow, difficult sometimes to put back together. And I think if you do have one of these patients in front of you, you really have to have a reductionist approach to keep it as simple as you possibly can. And the way you try and simplify this mess of vessels here is you break it down into exposure for your first maneuver. So how do you get access to these vessels? So we're assuming it's a right-sided pancreatic injury, so it's head and neck with the associated vessels I've just shown you. You hardly ever have to perform a laparotomy for just for pancreatic injury. It's often for associated injury and it's usually for bleeding. So if you think you've got a pancreatic injury and the patient's uh, bleeding, Open the patient, you get into the body and tail through the lesser sac. But if it's the head and neck, you do a cattle brash. And I just think of that as two overlapping C's. There's a C of the duodenum and the C of the right colon mobilization. And if you cut the peritoneal reflections down here, you can swing all of the viscera across the midline and it gets you right into the area of interest. But once you find that area, if you're faced with this, this mess or this mass of bleeding vessels, one of the key things I think is to break it into three different layers of bleeding in the surgical sole. The first layer is a superficial area, and this is bleeding that comes from the pancreatogenial complex itself, and that requires a cocker maneuver for control. Sometimes come into theatre to help people in this scenario who have done a cocker, and my observation is that if you're going to do a cocker, do it properly and make sure that you get your fingers right across the aorta. So when you do a cocker maneuver, you should feel your fingernails of this hand behind the duodenum pulsing against the aorta. If you haven't got that far across, then you haven't got decent control of the root vessels. So do a, a full cockerization and get right across the aorta before you try and do anything else. Then you just pinch that for control, call for help. Some of it just, just stops on its own. The middle layer is a lethal layer. This is the SMA, SMV in the portal vein. So that requires a cocker again for control, pinch the root of the mesentery, when you go to try and fix vessels in this area, it's important that you don't stitch bleeding. Stitching bleeding is disastrous because you'll tie off something that's important. So you want to stitch a dry hole in a blood vessel. And the way to try and get a dry hole in that area, and you might not be able to see it very well on the webcam, is to make a diamond manoeuvre. So you put two fingers behind the, the duodenum, someone else puts two fingers on top and you press down. So you've got SMV, SMA controlled, SMV, SMA controlled, and a space in the middle with hopefully a dryish hole that you can then stitch. The deep layer can be a challenge as well. This is the aorta and the cava and the renal vessels, obviously. You pack, you press, and you get proximal distal control and then repair these. Be very, very wary of penetrating injuries to the cava in, the, in this scenario, um, where you've got a hole at the back that you miss. So if you find a hole in the front of the cava, the first thing to do is get proximal distal control. And then you sometimes have to make that hole slightly larger to look through the back and just check you've not missed anything the other side. Control contamination from other injuries, that might mean stapling off bits of gut just to get you out. And then remember that these are often associated with lots of other problems. Here's a, an op note from Johannesburg. This was a laparotomy for a, a gunshot. You went through a midline. The take home message here is that it's rarely isolated. Large hemoperitoneum, a hole in the left diaphragm, a paired hole in the lesser curve of stomach. Anything that's hollow that has a hole in the front wall, whether it's the stomach or the cava, might have a hole in the back wall, just watch out for that. A large liver injury, an 80% transection of the body of pancreas, and a grade four left renal injury. So a nephrectomy was done, distal pancreatectomy, stomach was repaired, and you go back in again at a relook a few days later, this is you standing on the patient's left side looking into the left renal bed, you can see the source here, 
the colon and mesocolon have been reflected towards the patient's uh, midlines. That's a mattox maneuver. You can see the stapled or cut end of pancreas and the posterior hole in the stomach. So if you get a distal pancreatic injury like that, there's often other things around about it that are injured also. And then control pancreatic juice. So you expose the pancreas and then you did the simplest thing you possibly can. And the thing that I always remember in my head is just DDW. So place a drain if you can get away with it. Do a distal if you have to. You almost never, ever have to do a whipple for trauma. I don't eat crayfish, but apparently pancreatic trauma is like eating crayfish. And the key is to bite the tail and suck the head, apparently. And that means if you've got a pancreatic tail injury that's hanging off almost, you can staple it and take it out. If you've got a pancreatic head injury, try to leave a drain and do nothing. But actually drainage often works for pancreatic body and tail injuries as well. So try and do as little as you possibly can. On the very, very rare occasion you have to do a trauma whipple, and this hardly ever happens because the patients have usually exsanguinated before they get to you. It's only for major destructive injuries to the pancreatic duodenal complex, which you see here. Remember that it's only been done because you've got no other simple solutions. The injury is usually done most of the dissection for you with the spread of hematoma along the vessels. These patients are really uh, often profoundly unstable. So if you do have to do it, you do it as a two-stage procedure. And remember, it's not a cancer operation. You don't have to at least vessels. You can put a soft bowel clamp across the unsnit, just cut across it and then stitch across that. So here's the liver, patient's duodenum just here, a gunshot through the pancreatic duodenal complex where the forceps have gone. He came in shocked. Um, the trajectory was through the pancreatic head and through the ampulla and into the duodenum. So he had a trauma whipple. And the thing to take from this slide is how limited the resection is for a, a trauma whipple versus a cancer whipple. You staple just distal to the pylorus, you staple across D2, 3, and you take out as little pancreas as you can. You don't have to skeletalize vessels and you certainly don't reconstruct at the first operation. You place drains, damage control philosophy, and onto ITU to continue with your resuscitation. A couple of slides then I'll finish. That's the early management of pancreatic trauma, which is largely about controlling bleeding and controlling the flow of pancreatic juice through drainage or simple maneuvers. If they present to you with a late fistula, the principle is always the same. External and internal control. You get external control with PERP drainage, internal control with ERCP or EUS. You can see here ERCP and a large leak from the pancreatic duct. So you place a pancreatic duct stent to control that. But the key here is, is percutaneous drainage. And in Glasgow, we just keep place, placing drains until you get control. This is the, the Glasgow porcupine approach, but just keep putting in drains until you get control. And finally, if you're faced with a late collection and you can't get to it because there are no perk options and ERCP is not going to be a, an option for you, we manage quite a lot of these. We do a lot of our own EUS in the surgical unit in, in Glasgow Royal. If you've got a collection post-stabbing, for example, go down into the stomach, use a cystotome to burn through the back of the stomach or the duodenum into the collection just here. You can see the probe going in. You can see the bubbles around about it. It's quite a clean collection. There's not much necrosis like you would get with a, an acute pancreatitis. This is just a, a pancreatic fistula collection. And you can see we're now putting the second part of the cystotome down. We're about to deploy the stent. You'll see the, the distal flange just opening in a moment just here, like a little cocktail umbrella. The proximal flange opens into the stomach and that will often get you internal control of a late pancreatic collection. So the take home messages, diagnosis is based on having a very high index of suspicion. Remember that pancreatic juice can get anywhere. Secondly, remember that pancreatic trauma is rarely isolated and you need to have an effective strategy so you're calm under pressure for dealing with competing priorities. The surgical sequence for all these trauma patients is exactly the same. You control uh, immediately life threatening injury first, so that's bleeding control, enteric contamination control, and pancreatic juice control. If you do find a pancreatic injury at laparotomy, you want to think about doing the simplest thing possible to spare as much parenchyma as you can. Wide drainage will do for most pancreatic patients. And finally, remember that external control through as many per drains as you have to get internal control with ERCP, PD stenting and or EUS, and then sometimes surgery as a late maneuver as well. Thanks very much for your time. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, um, Ian. That's a fantastic talk. A really clear and valuable discussion of the approaches to pancreatic trauma.
I must say I was struck by some of the some of the real personal experience and practical insights that you've kind of given us this evening. Um, our first question is from Fenella, who's probably echoes of what a lot of us say. We're so glad that we don't see these very often. Um, oh my. <laughs> any tips or tricks for paediatric pancreatic trauma? Um, a group of patients who may be more at risk of pancreatic trauma potentially. Yeah, so we don't see as much of that because we have a children's hospital in Glasgow who deal with, with much of it, but we're sometimes called as pancreatic surgeons to help. And it's, it's not usually to operate on these patients. The classic uh, injury in the child, as you know, is the handlebar injury where you, you fracture the pancreas. And the two times that we are called are firstly because the CT scan looks like you've got a main pancreatic duct disruption and people are getting very concerned about it. I think going back to what Giles was saying earlier, it's about treating the patient and not the scan. If the patient's well with no big collection, I wouldn't ignore how the CT looks, but I wouldn't base all my management on the CT. I think CT tends to overstage main duct injury. So if you are called to help with a child who's had a cert who's been opened for different reasons, for example, bleeding or a, or a hollow visceral injury, and you're asked about an injured pancreas, almost no matter how bad it looks, I would put drains down and try and do as little as you possibly can. And it's interesting that the older you get, the less you try and do in these situations. So do as little as you can and just leave drains. The second scenario in which we are called for paediatric trauma is the late presentation, and that's with the acute fluid collection secondary to a parenchymal leak or a duct disruption. The old-fashioned surgical approach to that was distal pancreatectomy. That's, that's quite a big deal in, in, a, in a young child. So again, we would try and manage that endoscopically as best we can. And all you're trying to do is make sure that you're diverting pancreatic juice from the injured part of the pancreas back into the GI tract. And that's either done by ERCP with pancreatic duct stenting, which is often very effective, but if you've got a complete pancreatic duct transection, what you can do is an EUS drainage, which I showed you there, um, where you come through the back of the stomach and you can place pigtail stents, for example, which can stay in for a long time. And many of these will just settle. So as with everything to do with the pancreas, do as little as you can for as long as you can. And many times these things will settle. Thanks. We've had a couple of questions about some of the uh, other things that go around pancreatic trauma. We've had a question about nutrition and how do you approach early nutrition in these patients with major trauma, in, in, particularly in those who you kind of envisage an early return to theatre or, or a long haul stay? Yeah, so I think um, the algorithm for almost any pancreatic problem, again, is, is very simple. Um, eat if you can, NG if you can't, NG if it doesn't work, and parenteral if you have to. And that applies for almost every pancreatic patient. If you then bring trauma into that and the specific scenario you're mentioning where you're looking at relook laparotomies and perhaps delayed return to gut function. My threshold for TPN, I know this isn't popular, my threshold for TPN is probably going down because I think TPN is a lot safer than it was maybe when I started in surgery. So we don't see as much in the way of line sepsis and we don't get quite the same metabolic problems we used to get. And that's a function of just how good the parental nutrition service has become. So the case you're describing where you've got returns to theatre, perhaps a prolonged dialysis or delayed gastric emptying, try and get them over the surgical side of it first of all, and then um, perhaps with, with parental nutrition, and then start thinking about NG or NJ after that. Thanks. I was struck um, in your talk about the, the surgical descriptions um, that you've been describing for the approach to pancreatic trauma and the contrast between the relatively fewer kind of non-operative options described when you compare to so the two previous talks we've heard with esophageal and liver trauma. Is there a role for non-surgical treatment for early pancreatic trauma? And Natalie's asking about some of the things that you might institute for non-operative treatment of pancreatic trauma. That's a good question. So I, I can rarely remember actually having to operate for pancreatic trauma. You almost always operate for associated injuries. And the two things that you'd be operating for are either bleeding with no IR option, or for hollow visceral injury that you can't manage conservatively. And it just so happens the pancreas is injured as part of the, the, the trauma burden when the patient comes in. So to go back to your question, if it's an isolated pancreatic injury and there's no other reason to operate, try to do nothing. If there's a collection, drain it percutaneously. If it's a late presentation, drain it endoscopically or do, or do an ERCP. 
And along with that, th there are things that we sometimes try, like octreotide or, or the somatostatin analogues. That's not really evidence-based, but if you think you've got an uncontrolled or uncontrollable pancreatic leak, I sometimes think it, I think it's helpful sometimes in helping to turn off pancreatic secretions. But the mainstay of um, treatment for the patient that you've described is don't operate unless you have to control bleeding with IR if you can. And as long as you can get pancreatic juice either into the gut through an EUS or ERCP approach or out into a bag through a PERT drain approach, you shouldn't have to do anything about it. And then sit tight for as long as you can. Try and do as little as you can to the pancreas for as long as you can. Thanks. And, and finally, certainly with the centralisation of trauma services across the UK, um, these injuries, I suppose, have moved more and more into tertiary units. Um, and I must say, as a surgeon at Huddersfield, I'm very pleased to know that. Um, as we kind of less have less experience in the non-specialist centres, how, what kind of things might you advise a non-tertiary surgeon to do if they find themselves kind of managing pancreatic trauma in the context of other injuries? For example, Farid has asked, what would you do with the pancreatic dirt if you stapled it off for a trauma whipples? So you mean if you've done a trauma whipple and, and, and stapled the pancreas? Yeah. So um, I wouldn't, I would try not to staple the pancreas in that scenario uh, because you'll get a terrible obstructive pancreatitis. So what you can do is, um, if you're having to do a trauma whipple, and, it, and it's, it's vanishingly rare that you have to do that, but if you have to do it, staple across um, the pylorus or distal stomach, staple across D2-3, put a soft bowel clamp or a stapler across the unsinet and staple that and forget about the SMA and SMV. Leaving a bit of pancreas behind is absolutely fine. Taking a bit of SMV or portal vein with you is not a great idea. So to, to try and stay away from the, the vessels if you can. And you can come through the, the, the head of the pancreas um, with diathermy, for example. In that situation, you're trying to control the pancreatic effluent. And what I would do is get a, an umbilical catheter, um, maybe a, a, a four French or a, or a five French catheter, put little perforations in it and put that into the pancreatic duct, if you can see it, and then bring that out as an external pancreatic drain. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't obsess about that because the chance of you seeing a normal pancreatic duct is vanishingly small because the duct might only be a millimetre or two. And you could spend a lot of time trying to get a drain into the, the main PD. So in that scenario, if you're left with a pancreatic remnant and you're not going to be putting it back together and you've controlled the bleeding, just leave some big drains down to the pancreas and come back out again. Controlled pancreatic fistulae don't cause problems. It's, it's the uncontrolled situation. And so big, wide drainage is the key to that scenario. Yeah, and that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, really that's all. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to hand you back to Andy now, who's going to introduce our last speaker of the evening. Uh, thanks, you, and thanks, Oren. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Mr. Alex Navarro, who all of you will know is uh, a consultant HPB and trauma surgeon at Nottingham. Nottingham is a major trauma centre and is probably one of the UK's largest. Um, and Alex is going to talk about what happens after we've done potentially the, uh, the damage control and how we manage the open abdomen, Alex. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. So uh, I very much want to set the, the open abdomen, if you like, and then its management within damage control, because it's very much a key part of it, but it's not the only story. So I hope that's all right. Um, as you've said, I come from Nottingham, um, the home of the mighty Nottingham Forest and the East Mid Midlands Major Trauma Centre. And that's the, the big building we call the Mothership. Um, obviously most famous for, for Robin Hood, and I'm pleased to report that penetrating trauma remains just as popular as it did in his day, uh, especially during lockdown, it would appear. We have had, God, it's, it's maybe a 50-60% increase in penetrating trauma, knife crime within, within our, uh, our patch. Um, we've just had some three great talks, two of them relate to, to HPV-specific trauma from my colleagues Ewan and, and, uh, and, and the great Professor Toogood, they're so good they must have paid great attention to our chapter in the companion series about HPV trauma, so I appreciate that they've paid such great attention to those. Also a quick shout out to um, uh, my colleagues, a lot of this talk comes from a paper that we published in the BJA a few years back about damage control, so thank you to my colleagues there. So as I've said, the, the open abdomen is, is a key part of, of the damage control paradigm. Now the damage control surgery 
which came in as, a, as an idea, if you like, before damage control resuscitation, which is an important um, a part of the whole picture, um, is by definition leaving the abdomen open at the end of the operation. And that's to prioritize short-term physiology over anatomical reconstruction. The, the situation that Ewan describes with the, the occasional trauma whipple that's required, uh, if you were to get to the point of the resection phase being over and then start to do your anastomosis, you will end up with a dead patient. So in those patients, a damage control decision is very clear. Equally, at the point of getting in contact with these patients, we now are implementing as, as major trauma centers, damage control resuscitation techniques in order to avoid the lethal triad of acidosis, hypothermia and coagulopathy. That situation where you're coming to the end of your operation and everything just starts to bleed from everywhere. And at that point you've lost the patient. So the question I think in terms of the open abdomen is, is really the same question as to institute a damage control protocol or not. And appropriate selection is critical. Now, there isn't a single physiological scoring system or a single factor that we can look at to make these decisions. And often um, the decision will be fairly subconscious. You'll know that you're doing a damage control uh, procedure because of the patient's degree of injury. However, if we go too far in that direction, we may deny some patients who have good physiology. So, for example, if we do really good damage control resuscitation and get that patient straight to theatre, we may have a situation where we can complete that patient's operation and close the abdomen. And that will decrease the amount of resource we're requiring for theatre and intensive care. And also, if we leave abdomens open, uh, the situation hasn't changed in that we still have a risk of infection, fistulae, uh, and hernia ultimately if we can't close. So the indications for a DT approach, and you know, there's several listed there, which are, um, are fairly intuitive. And um, the thing that, 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 that strikes me is, is, is that first point is that the mechanism of injury, there are some patients you just know that you're going to have to do it. Uh, equally, as we've, we've heard from some of the questions, there are some you know, occasionally people managing trauma colleagues who don't do it very often. Uh, and, in, and in those individuals operating on these, on these patients, um, the thought processes may not be as ingrained as they are with those who deal with it every day. What I would advise is that if, you, if you're dealing with a big trauma case and you've been there for an hour and a half and you're still going, you need to be thinking about getting that patient into, into IQ. Just to run through quickly the stages of, of damage control, just so you know what I'm talking about later. Um, this is this is how it's been structured. DC naught is pre-hospital. DC one is the trauma laparotomy. Uh, DC two is the open abdomen on ITU, and DC three is the return to theatre for a definitive completion of whatever we need to do operatively and closure of the fascia. So I'm not going to stay too long on this. I'm going to get through the first parts and onto the sort of the surgical management we're talking about today. But but DC naught is it's very much uh, as I say, pre-hospital in the context of, of England, certainly in the major trauma centres, when we get highly injured patients, it's usually via a helicopter. Um, and on that helicopter will be uh, fairly highly trained individuals who have likely tubed the patient. They may well have uh, um, started all the, the various uh, blood products that you require. And hopefully they haven't opened the chest without needing to. Situation we sometimes find. But it's a scoop and run rather than a stay in place. Get that patient straight to the major trauma centre, potentially bypassing units that haven't been designated as such. So don't go to the nearest hospital, go to the hospital where you have the correct resource. Excuse me for a sec. Not gin, I promise. So damage control resuscitation, just briefly. It's a focus on, uh, on the bleeding, if you like, permissive hypertension, use of tranexamic acid. And, and resuscitation, not with crystalloid like ATLS says, but with, with blood products. Now I put this up not to look clever because I don't know what any of it means, but um, it's just to highlight that if you have a team that's using the correct um, type of, uh, all the technology available to us, then prior to arrival in theater, it's potential that you've got the information to tell you exactly what blood products that patient needs. And it's those kind of interventions that put that's in a position to physiologically get the patient through the first laparotomy and beyond, uh, and ultimately 
um, been instrumental in decreasing mortality from major trauma. So as, as Ewan absolutely correctly said, you know, the keep it simple in terms of the trauma laparotomy, you need to control hemorrhage, control contamination, and then get out. Uh, and that's where we come to talk about managing the open operation. You know, be that with packing, with a, with a suture, uh, I find temporizing with hemostatic patches can be very useful to allow you to get control of that big bleeding and then get to the injury uh, without the patient having exsanguinated. Um, but it's at this point, which you go into the next bit, that's the, that's the instrument I use to control contamination pretty much exclusively, uh, drains as well. And then when you've got to that point, you're transitioning into, uh, into DC2 from DC1, the end of the operation, uh, and that's where um, you need to be thinking about how you, what you're going to do about the open abdomen. Now, as I've said, and, and I think both you and, 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 and uh, Professor Tugood alluded to this, is communication with your team. At the beginning of your operation, it may well be clear to you you're going to end up with an open abdomen at the end of your procedure. So just as you might ask for your um, table-mounted retractor, your omnitractor, whatever else, or whatever other equipment you may require, I will say this is likely to end with a uh, negative pressure uh, device and don't get it now, but it's something that I need to be ready at the end of the surgery so we can minimize the time that the patient is in. So temporary abdominal closure. So there's very much been an evolution in, in how we manage uh, the open abdomen. Um, prior to the, the major trauma centers, um, concentrating the volume into certain centers and therefore concentrating the experience. I think most of our experience of, of the open abdomen came from management of complications of elective surgery. And there have been iterations of various things that we can do to do that, ranging from top right, there's a picture of a simple placement of a pack and an off-site device. Uh, on the far left is an illustration of the Bogotar bag, which was uh, a, an invention of uh, people dealing with major, major trauma, usually with gunshot injury in, the, in, in South America, uh, where Heath Robinson style, open up a, uh, uh, an IV bag, stitch it together and stitch it to the wound. But the principles involved are an attempt to seal the abdomen, both from to protect it from the outside in terms of contamination or infection, but also to protect uh, the bowel itself from drying, increased possibility of fistula formation for that reason, uh, equally uh, to seal in, if you like, the, the fluid that naturally develops. And in the bottom picture, you can see the early sort of development of a more sophisticated system. Again, people are making up as they go along, but involving negative pressure by placing drains along the packs to try and draw that fluid away um, to, to control that situation. So this is, this is a system that, that we use in, in, in Nottingham. Um, it's used very frequently now in terms of damage control for, for major intradominal injury. Um, the system involves five parts. Just draw your attention to the left side of the screen. In the center there, there is a, an apron formed of uh, a plastic sheet, um, two layers, which incorporates these blue foam sections. And if you can imagine, uh, once we've placed that, we want the fluid to be passing through those foam sections to the center. Uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know how widespread around the uh, around our units these things are, but having got used to using them, little tip uh, when placing that uh, internal device, the, uh, the the apron skirt, you want it to fit nicely. So I tend to lay it on the uh, on the patient's abdomen as I'm about to place it. And then from each of the skin edges, north, south, east, and west, I place a hand down to see how far roughly it needs to sit. And then I will cut the sheet at the relevant level. Um, also I tend to cut straight through the big the squares that you can see, and that's so that you can pull the foam out so there's no possibility of foam going against viscera. So once you place that sheet, as you can see from the right side, it should sit as the internal layer covering the the bow. And then we place the next layer, which is the uh, the blue foam segments, which should go up against the skin edge. Uh, usually one is enough. Sometimes you need to layer two if you've got a big patient. And then on top of that, uh, on the bottom right, you can see those um, layers of adhesive sheeting, which we peel a layer off, stick it down, 
uh, peel the top layers off on the sides and then sequentially go around the abdomen to form a sealed sheet around it. Now, again, here, the really important thing with these closure systems is that we're at a point where we've controlled bleeding and contamination. What's really key for that patient is that they're not in theatre anymore and they get to ITU as, simple, as soon as possible. And as you get used to these things, you can apply them very rapidly. But the way of getting it wrong is to get it wet. So if the abdomen, if the skin around is not dry to at least seven or eight centimetres from skin edge, you're not going to get a good seal. So teams are usually giving me nice packs and we're getting these things on nice and quickly and the pump is ready, which is the next step. You can see the two elements there of the pump itself and also the tubing applicator, which is again an adhesive system. And once you have that and turn the pack on, everything pulls in quite nicely, fluid goes up the paraconic gutters and you can see that that's a well-placed back on the right side there where you get nice pulling in of the tissues um, which of course limits the regression laterally of the abdominal wall, which can cause us issues with closure later. Um, just a, a little thing I didn't think of while writing the talk, but has occurred to me listening to others today, is that I will routinely use drains with an abthera. If you can see that the fluid that the abthera takes or a similar system, sorry to use the brand name, uh, comes from the paracolic gutters. So if you place uh, a drain next to a site for a potential bio leak or indeed a, a cut surface pancreas, then we do see that that fluid goes into the drains rather than into the vac itself. Um, and so th th there's nothing that um, precludes you using a drain approach if you're using one of these closure systems. Um, when they first came on the market, there was certainly a an element of concern about fistula formation. I think that was... Uh, as a result of possibly poor application and a few uh, um, episodes of fistula formation. And in 2009, NICE actually issued a guideline saying uh, essentially that more research was required. I think that that's there now. Uh, I've just put up um, for anyone's reference, let me look it up later, um, some good papers that relate to use of these negative pressure systems. Um, they've been demonstrated to effectively remove fluid. They seal the cavity. There's decreased rates of abdominal compartment syndrome, as you might imagine, um, and we haven't seen those rates of fistula formation that people were concerned about. And the key thing for me is that there are significantly increased rates of, fascia, of primary fascial closure when we refer them to theatre. So we've our device on or use whatever technique of temporary abdominal closure that we have access to. Um, not to say that the negative pressures are the only ones, you know, I've certainly used upside sandwiches effectively in the past. Um, I think what these systems do allow us to do is they give us a longer period of time before we have to take the patient back. So often, if you have a, a very high level injury with a, a large, a very high injury severity score, then that patient's physiology can take a, long, a bit longer to correct. And therefore, if you're forced to take a patient back early in order because your closure system has failed, um, that would be a negative thing because you're unable to be in a position to definitively manage that patient. So in my experience, and certainly in our experience in Nottingham, they've been a, a bit of a game changer for us. This is what the ITU patients have said. You absolutely said this is a team game. Um, a majorly injured trauma patient who gets out of the door and recovers is not just because of us by any stretch. Uh, and these are what the intensive care doctors are going to, to, to be looking at. Um, just to pick out a couple of points, nutrition. Um, there's nothing to stop you using uh, enteral nutri nutrition while there's an open abdomen. Um, in fact, good evidence that if you have, uh, and I take you and point about TPN and I agree with it, I think we use TPN much more, uh, with, with much less concern uh, than, than previously because of the factors you had mentioned but we will institute TPN plus trophic feeding. So low, low rate feeding um, does seem to protect against fish. It's not, a, not going to provide the, the calorific requirement, but some feed is better than none, it would appear. Uh, equally, fluid balance is a, is a big point for us. A lot, a lot of the time, if we go return to theatre and we can't close or we can't form an astomosis, it will be because of edema. Uh, and this is where the, this, this open abdomen approach is, is very important. So we then plan to return to theatre for completion. This is DT3. 
Um, as I've said, effective temporary closure allow us, allows us to pick the right time physiologically to take that patient back. Um, as other, others have said, you know, this may be at the point if someone's presented to a peripheral unit that they've been transferred for this stage, get the right people. Um, so you'll know what injuries are in that abdomen um, and therefore you'll know what teams best placed. Combinations of teams works well if, if you have somebody who's in over, overall decision control. Um, hints and tips for getting packs out, lots and lots and lots of wash. Uh, take your time and be gentle and they will always come out. Uh, repeat the laparotomy completely, re-examine everything, missed injuries, etc. And expect that in some cases, that second look that you're planning to be the last look won't be because you'll get something you don't expect, an injury that you've not identified or bleeding reoccurring, and then you have to go back to plan A. Uh, abdominal wall closure completes DC3 if you achieve definitive management, even if that involves drainage to, uh, and controlled fistulae. So what do you do if you can't close the abdomen? Uh, there are several options, and I have to say, um, not all the options I'm going to present, I've personally used or had any uh, involvement with, I think because of the way that we manage trauma these days, with the damage control, the, the, the amount of instances of not being able to close the abdomen are relatively small, um, but these are your options. So you could think, okay, well, this looks like it will close in a couple of days if the edema goes off, you can put your system back on and plan to come back in a couple of days. You can say, we're gonna close it a little bit. Um, so go top and bottom with your usual mass closure and then uh, reapply the system and hope that things get better in a couple of days again. I have on occasion with, with patients, so there was a, a trauma whipple. We've had to do a couple of trauma whipples, mainly due to sword injuries here, and that's, it was unavoidable. I did try not to do them, but um, we've closed the abdomen with a lateral release and component separation in a young patient who wasn't, wasn't big, so that worked well. Um, this is more with um, elective open abdomens, but uh, sometimes you do get to the point where you accept uh, a laparostomy and just close the skin and, and accept the hernia and come back and fight another day. Uh, the Whitman patch is a picture there. This has been used predominantly in the US. It's, a, it's like a Velcro system where you increase pressure over time. And along the same principle, uh, we did have a, a, a try of the ABRA system, which is this uh, combined, uh, you can, I'm not sure you can see the picture in the right bottom, but essentially, it's, uh, the principle is to place uh, sutures effectively across the abdominal wall, which are then sequentially tightened to bring the wall together in combination with a, uh, a vacuum system along the lines of the Abthera. And there are a couple of small papers that suggest that this may be uh, superior in uh, increasing closure. As you can, I think the type of patient that you see illustrated there is the type of patient you would use it on, uh, and it, it ain't cheap, is the other point. So to come to the end, I think the the open abdomen is a really key decision uh, and really reflects the fact that you've, you're taking a damage control approach to that patient who has a high level of injury. And the damage control is, is something that we're, we're, we're focusing on physiology. And I think um, uh, in Professor Tugud's talk, when he talks about how to, to treat the patient, a lot of our decisions that we make about whether we manage injury surgically are based on the physiology, not on the appearances on the CT. And that these approaches are, are showing us improvement in, in, in outcomes for trauma patients across the board. Uh, my personal view is that the trauma open abdomen, and we're talking about trauma today, is best managed with a temporary closure negative pressure device. That's the standard of care uh, for, for us. Um, and just to reiterate that it's a, it's, it's a big team approach to get good outcomes for, uh, for these patients. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Brilliant, Alex, uh, a fantastic talk there. Um, Alex, um, just a quick question. You said um, you will put drains in to manage potential leaks such as bile. What sort of drains do you use um, in that situation? I tend to use a, a, a biggish Robinson. So I'd, I'd use a, a, good, vol a good bore uh, tube drain in most instances in trauma and you don't have any. You don't have problems with the fat leaking through the tube drain and that's it. I think in the context of a, in the context of um, 
of trauma, and I'm not necessarily talking about an elective complication management scenario, but um, we haven't seen major issues. We're usually taking patients back after 36 to 48 hours, and therefore a placement of a, of a decent sized drain in the region of an injury is something we're gonna manage definitively later. So I'm not leaving a drain expecting it to do a job for a number of weeks or months. Uh, and I guess if we do end up in that position, then a, the drain choice would, would be different. I, uh, if I'm closing uh, a patient after a trauma with say, for example, a pancreatic tail injury, uh, where I have uh, uh, either a stapled or a sutured uh, distal pancreas, I'd probably put a Jackson Pratt there um, as a slightly, to, to avoid that kind of issue. Great. Uh, I've got a question from Merv Reese, but I, I'm not sure how much of a question. I think it's a request. And despite your um, explanation of how to cite the amphitheory, do you think you could produce a video that we could place on our algis? I'm going to advertise it now on new Algis YouTube channel to show us all how you do it. Well, you'd have to approach my agent, Andy, but I'm sure we can come to an agreement. Yeah, okay, yes, sure. Yes, no problem. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wary of time. It's now half past eight on a Wednesday evening, and I'm going to draw what has been an excellent um, session to a close. I'd like to thank Nick, Giles, Ewan and Alex for some fantastic talks. I'd also like to thank all our participants, all our audience who've asked some great questions to our panellists. Um, also need to thank Sarv and Nicola who yet again have organised uh, an excellent evening. Um, we still have more uh, webinars coming uh, on in the future. There is one next week based primarily on endoscopy and hopefully you'll be able to produce in the near future um, our plan for the, the remainder of the year, uh, just to keep us all interested during lockdown. Once again, thanks very much, everybody, and thank you for your time, uh, uh, and thank you.